If you look at high level runners, and I mean distance athletes, you will see that a number of them have what people will consider movement flaws. That would be knee valgus, over pronation, all of these things. Their arms might cross midline when they're running because those things aren't really flaws. We've just called them flaws and we don't really have the reason to do that. As one of the top female runners in the world, looks like her knees are gonna slam together and she has an egg beater when she runs. One of the top marathoners in the world has a huge amount of, of pronation. So it looks like the inside of his ankles are hitting the ground. These are just normal patterns for them. The first person to deadlift five times their body weight had like a scoliosis like that. It's like a massive curve. There's a, a website for pro athletes with Sherman's disease, which is like a ky kyphosis. You know, these are elite athletes with that. If you look at the Paralympics, there would be incredible compensations and changes in movement patterns. If those movement patterns were so horrible, then how do we even have the Paralympics, right? The, the body is pretty amazing and, and adaptable. So when biomechanics and posture might be important is I kind of separate them into five crude categories, but maybe we'll just focus on two. High load activities, I think that biomechanics are pretty important. If we go and I jump off a roof, there's probably a better way to land because there you're talking about actual tissue injury and your biomechanics and your form, you know, can really influence tissue injury. So dynamic knee valgus, which can overload the ACL and cause it to fail. Posture is pretty important then, but maybe for patellofemoral pain syndrome, where you're not really breaking the kneecap, you know, posture gets less important. Where tissues fail, that's where we can learn a ton from biomechanics. And then when you see low load activities where it's more repeated, that's where biomechanics becomes less important. The other area where I'd say posture is important is like a habit. So let's say my back hurts when I flex it. And then for some reason, I always flex my spine during everything I do. So I keep persisting into the pain and maybe learning to have pain. There the biomechanics is important because it's a habit and I keep aggravating it. It's not that flexing is bad. It's not that there's one right way to sit. It's just that I keep pissing it off and I just need to give it a bit of a break. So you break the habit for a bit, they settle down and then they're fine and it doesn't matter what they do in the future. We know that expectation has a huge influence on physiological functions, you know, and certainly in pain. That's why we have all this placebo research. You set people up to think that sitting in a really arched position or a flex position or sitting all day is going to cause pain, then it's likely that that can sensitize them. But the best example I can give is taste. So we think that taste is just sensors on the tongue and then it's perceived as an apple, I'm eating an apple. Well, have you ever went to have a, a, a drink of something and it's an opaque glass and you think it's orange juice and you go up and you expect it to be orange juice and you take a sip and it's not orange juice, it was really milk. That thing tastes disgusting because there's a conflict with what you expected. Now, if it was just purely physiology or purely sensors from the tongue, which would be an analog to nociception, then we would taste it as milk. Otherwise it tastes disgusting, you know, and there's the idea of the role of expectation. So if you set someone up to think that sitting in a certain position or sitting too long or having their head forward is going to cause pain, then you can actually increase their sensitivity. So if someone is in pain, why does changing posture help reduce it? So uh, sometimes it doesn't. That's the problem. You get people who are hypervigilant, you know, and it can lead to more sensitivity. Yeah, otherwise, you know, we would be eliminating all neck pain in the office by going in there and telling people how to sit and getting them different chairs and changing their monitor height. So we've tried these, you know, simple postural uh, interventions and they just don't seem to help. I was in the military before and uh, it would hurt just standing at attention the whole time or standing at ease. And technically you're in the ideal posture then. Like it doesn't matter what posture you're in, sometimes it's, it's gonna hurt and it feels better to do something else. Maybe it's the lack of movement that's the bigger problem. If you want to have different postures, go ahead. You can sit anywhere you like. I like to encourage people to think that there's nothing off limits. Certain movements might be off limits for a bit, but in the future you can end up tolerating everything. So I don't want to make a big deal about posture or anything for that matter. Right, because then you start thinking that 
they need fixing. I know people can adapt to any posture that they get in if they desensitize to it. So I, I, I actually don't make that big a deal about, about any posture. It's just easier that way.